Hi, everybody, and welcome to our first webinar for the 2013-2014 Ask an Expert webinar series. Today's topic is Strong Assessment, Practical Interpretation Strategies. My name is Karen Gonzalez, and I'm the Associate Marketing Manager here at CBP. I'll be moderating today's webinar. But first, I want to do a quick walkthrough of the webinar format for those of you that may be attending for the first time. So today's webinar will run for approximately 90 minutes. During the presentation, if you have questions, please submit them to me using the question function in the webinar controls. Judy is going to be pausing throughout the webinar today to answer those questions, and I'll give everyone a chance to send them in during these breaks. Now we have a representative from CPP's education team here. We have Jack Powers, and he's going to be available to answer questions as well. As with all of our webinars, today's webinar is being recorded, and we'll be sending out a link to the recording in the next few days. Please note that the PowerPoint slides are not available for the Ask an Expert series. Now, I want to share something, and may, many of you may have seen it yesterday, but due to the success of last May's Twitter contest, I decided to do another one and start the series off with it. So, Judy, do you mind switching to the next slide? So, here are the rules. So, what we're going to do is the top five tweeters will win. We found this little mug set, a little mug with ten. Um, the rules are simple. Just follow at CBC Education. Um, make sure that you use pound CPP AAE in all of your tweets because this is how I can track you. So if you don't use that, I'm not going to be able to see what, what you're tweeting out to us. Um, no repeat tweets. And the contest will end today at 1 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. And then I'll be announcing the winners through uh, Twitter later today. So it kind of takes me a little while um, to sort through those, so bear with me, but I'll announce it later today. And, well, so now that I've announced that, if you have any questions about that contest, you can definitely send me a question about that, and I'll be happy to answer it. So just have fun with it. That's what it's supposed to be for. Um, so now I'm very happy to welcome the CBC's Ask an Expert, Judy Gruder. G is principal and trainer. Judy has been a career development program consultant and trainer for more than 35 years, as well as a national certified counselor and NCDA master career counselor. She's a recognized authority on the uses of assessments in career counseling, and is co-author of a number of publications and reports on the Strong Interest Inventory, such as the I Start Strong Report and Myers-Briggs Tools. So please join me in welcoming her. And now I'd like to turn over the webinar to Judy. So welcome, Judy. Thanks, Karen. And hi, everyone. It's really good to be back with you after our summer break. It seems like months and months. Um, and today we're going to talk about the Strong. And I'm always excited to talk about the Strong. Even though the Strong has been around forever, it seems, actually since the 1920s, sometimes I feel like it's one of the best kept secrets in career assessment. To some people, it looks very simple. It, it looks like a personality description and some job titles. But hiding behind this apparent simplicity is a multi-layered assessment that can be useful to clinicians and career practitioners alike. To some people, it looks very complicated, pages and pages of numbers and bar graphs. But this apparent complexity can be broken down into easily understandable patterns for both practitioners and students and clients. And today, we're going to look at some practical interpretation strategies for career counselors and academic advisors. And while we're going through the assessment, jot down your questions as they come to you and send them to Karen. I'll be pausing several times to address them. We're going to take a look at the REASEC framework and its implications for, ca for career counseling. The theory itself has a lot, of, um, a lot of depth and impacts how the strong is interpreted. We're going to approach academic advising through the basic interest scales. We're going to look at using the occupational scales to enter the internet world of ONET, and then some creative approaches to the personal style scales. Now, I mentioned a minute ago that the Strong has been around since the 1920s. And what sets it apart from other interest inventories is that it's based on the empirical research of E.K. Strong, testing and defining the personalities of workers in various occupations. Over the years, it's been revised frequently. The last update, in fact, was in uh, 2012. John Holland's REASEC framework was added to the assessment in the 1970s, but the original empirical scales, the occupations, are still the heart of the strong. There are over 160 scales on the strong that flow from the very broad to the very specific. Um, I like this geographic analogy of how they flow. Think of the occupational themes as the state in which you live. I've taken the liberty of using California here. 
And then the basic interest scales, think of those as the city or town in which you live. The occupational scales then would be the street address. And the personal style scales are the way you decorate your home. Sometimes when you're thinking about where to live, the geographic location comes to mind first, and other times your personal style is the priority. We're going to approach the strong today from both of those directions. The strong scales are linked to John Holland's Reasek theory of vocational psychology, the theory that's the most widely used in this country, and in fact in most of the world, to describe people and to categorize work environments. There's six basic categories of personality, six corresponding categories of work environments, and most people in work environments are a combination of categories. Work environments are formed by the people who work in them, not by the tasks that are done. This is important because this is the basis of the coding of the strong. We naturally search for our people, people who have our personality code, when we're looking for, for a potentially satisfying work environments. Now the six categories, they're called general themes, are arranged around a hexagon. And what is key to this theory is what I just said, that work environments are formed by the people in them, not by the work tasks themselves. For instance, Social helpers usually like, care, like doing caring and supportive tasks. But even when they're working at conventional, practical, and efficient tasks, they create a social helping environment. Now the theory says that the categories next to each other on this hexagon have overlapping characteristics. The categories opposite each other are very different. The implications of this for um, actually doing career counseling are, are, are pretty, um, pretty important. Most personalities and work environments are made up of two or three adjoining letters. Now, these themes are fully described for respondents in their profile results, in the interpretive report, And in the Where Do I Go Next interpretive booklet that's recommended for use uh, with, strong, with, with any strong results, I, I always give this booklet to uh, anyone that I'm administering the strong to. Now there's some implications of the Reasek theory itself that impact the results of the strong and how we approach career counseling with students and clients. Remember I said that most people's codes are made up of two or three letters. And for most people, the letters will be adjacent on the hexagon. This is because the adjacent themes on the hexagon have overlapping characteristics. A typical combination might be artistic, social, enterprising, using creativity to help others be successful. The order matters, by the way. The first letter is the primary personality driver or personality um, motivator. This is what a typical profile looks like for a respondent whose three highest themes are adjacent on the hexagon ASE. I'm going to come back in a few minutes and talk about the numbers and things, so don't worry about those yet. Sometimes the themes are opposite each other on the hexagon, representing very diverse interests. And it's challenging to find career fields that incorporate opposite themes. This one I've indicated realistic and social. For instance, R, realistic, involves physical activity and working with things, and S involves sedentary work, working with people. The most common way to satisfy both is to satisfy one theme through work, the other through leisure. We can do this with most of the combinations. The one that's the hardest to do it with is the artistic conventional, conventional artistic combination. That one takes a little bit more depth. Unless you're fortunate enough to work as an athletic coach, you're not likely to find a job that combines two codes, for instance, like R and S. This is what a typical profile looks like for opposing theme codes. This is SR. And notice that differentiation isn't too clear. It's when you have opposing theme codes in the first two letters, very often the rest of the profile kind of cancels each other out. It loses its shape. 
Now, keeping the Reasec theory in mind, readiness for career counseling, that's an important concept. If, uh, if someone isn't ready for career exploration, um, then the strong isn't going to give them the readiness. It's just, it's going to be a tool for exploration. But readiness for career counseling depends on two things. First of all, the stability of interests, and secondly, personality differentiation. Stability of interests is, um, is measured by, is, is considered from a consistency of theme codes over time. And what, what I always think of when I talk about um, stability and consistency is um, in, in Holland's self-directed search, the SDS, which a lot of us use, there's an activity called occupational daydreams. And, um, and he, puts, he put that activity right up front before the assessment is actually taken. And I always use it, no matter what REASEC instrument I'm using, I always use the occupational daydreams exercise. What it asks us to do, what it asks the student to do, is uh, to list every occupation or career that they've ever thought about doing or, or becoming or, or exploring, all the way back as far as they can possibly remember. And they're to list them in chronological order and then code each of the daydreams, each of the occupations that they've thought about. And what you're going to notice, the practitioner, when you look at this list, um, is that when, when someone is, is very young in their childhood, they're likely to have a smattering of themes from all around the hexagon as they mature through elementary school and middle school and high school and eventually college and into the world of work the themes get more focused and the other themes tend to disappear or become much less important and uh, um, when I was putting this webinar together I actually did this did the exercise for my own career pattern um, and I thought it might be interesting one, so that you can see how it's done, and two, because I happen to be one of those people with opposing theme codes. The first thing that came to mind was that when I was four years old, I wanted to be a veterinarian on a farm. And shortly after that, I have memories of sitting at my father's, my father was a businessman, and I remember sitting at his big leather desk and playing secretary, and the phone had lots of buttons on it that I used to punch, and I used to um, pretend I was taking shorthand and things. My father had a wonderful secretary that was with him for almost 50 years, and back when I was a child playing secretary at dad's desk, she used to come in and out uh, of the office and talk to me about running my own business. And that's where that started. And I, I sort of imagined myself through that period as being an office manager and a bookkeeper. And in fact, I, at one point, I actually dropped out of college and got a certificate in office management because I, I, th that seemed to be something that back in the, in the 50s and 60s, a woman could do and have a career. But you know, I got to high school and I started writing poetry. I loved poetry and I loved writing. And as I moved through high school, I, I fell in love with science. But girls weren't supposed to like science back then, so I kind of drifted away from it. When I got to college, I majored in English and psychology, mostly because I was supposed to as a female in the late 50s and early 60s. But while I was majoring in, in English and psychology, I kept taking classes in business. Now my first real job out of college, remember I had that dual major and then lots of business classes, was actually as a community college counselor in the career development office of our local community college. And within three months I became the acting director and started going to graduate school. And in graduate school I found research and I found assessments. You can probably see what's happening here. Everything I have done since has been a combination of research, managing others, and running a business. Now can you, my, and my code, my, um, my got code on the strong happens to be investigative enterprising. And, and the first letter um, will alternate. I'll go through kind of five-year stretches where I is first, and then I'll kind of switch and E will be first, which is typical of people with opposing codes. I wasn't actually ready for career counseling until I got into my first real job and uh, got into graduate school, and I took these assessments in high school, and I took them in college, and I can remember them being all over the place, and, uh, and the counselor just shaking his head. <laughs> and the, the moral to this story is that if personality hasn't formed, the strong will suggest some discussion points, but it won't suggest a clear path for career exploration. 
In those instances, we have to trust our narrative skills and know what questions to ask and how to listen. Sometimes the MBTI will provide the personality differentiation that isn't yet being expressed in RIASEC interests. One of the things I want to say about this opposing pattern, whether it's um, no matter what the pattern is, is that if your personality happens to be differentiated and happens to have opposing codes, it isn't likely that coming right out the door from college, you're going to find a career path that integrates the two. Um, what I noticed over the 30 years after college was I kept switching back and forth. It wasn't really until my 50s that I found a place where I and E could come together comfortably and have almost equal importance in, uh, in my personality and in the way I approached work. And it's sometimes helpful to explain that um, to college students that uh, finding the career isn't something that happens at one point in time when they graduate from college. It's something that develops. Um, and it, it, you know, as they learn and have experience as they go through the 40, 50 years that they're likely to be working, the career, the, the personality gels and, and you know it when it gels. It's almost, a, it's, you know, I kind of feel like when it finally gels is when you're ready to deinstitutionalize and, and go play <laughs> instead of working. Now this is, a, this is an undifferentiated profile. And I think it's the hardest um, kind of profile to pull anything out of. And note that the top two are, are um, opposite, which they often are when the personality is undifferentiated. In this case, it's realistic and social, uh, and it's a female. This is kind of the I don't know, you tell me person. Uh, I've noticed that it's almost always accompanied by slight PCIs on the MBTI. A little bit later, um, I'll talk about ways to try to differentiate themes like these through the personal style scales. I've started today with some implications of reassect theme variations to emphasize some important points. No career assessment stands alone. It's part of a larger counseling or advising framework. And the strong is only one piece in the assess yourself phase of career counseling, albeit a very important piece. Um, I'm going to I'm going to pause for those of you who are forming questions. I'm going to pause after the next slide if you want to uh, start sending them to Karen. Okay, so I have um, I do uh, have Karen Karen uh -huh. Karen. We're going to pause after the next slide. Oh, okay, the next one. Okay, great. Okay, um, th there's um, a huge misunderstanding of both clients and practitioners, especially practitioners who are new, who are new to assessments, that, um, that an assessment can provide answers. And on its own, the strong just doesn't. It provides us with the tools to generate meaningful questions and to guide the career exploration process. But interpreting career assessments, I think, is as much an art as it is a science. We start with data that's research-based, and then we search for meaningful patterns in the results but we can't be creative with results that don't have the science behind them. We start with investigative data, we impose artistic patterns, and we have the hoped for outcome of helping, helping our students and clients to, um, to reach uh, some clarity on, on next steps. And I'm going to walk you through the strong profile now, emphasizing how the profile pieces fit together and specific applications of each section. But before we go ahead, um, Karen, let's pause and I'll see if I can address some of the questions that might be coming in. Okay, great. So um, we have one from Barb. Um, Barb says, I have so many clients who show high and artistic and conventional, and it always causes problems. I know one strategy is to try to determine what is hobby-based versus vocation-based, but these folks are always troubled, it seems. Yeah, and I, I mentioned, when I was talking about opposing themes, Barb, I mentioned that. Um, I mentioned it because the AC combination is, um, is the most challenging to deal with. It's the one combination that rarely lends itself to working in one corner of the hexagon and, and having hobbies and leisure interests in the other corner. Um, first of all, this is my opinion, but I've been using the strong for 40 years, and I've used it in a clinical setting and also in a college advising setting, and it, it, what I'm about to say seems to be what happens. When people have an AC combination, they're almost always artistic. 
and conventional has been imposed somewhere um, as a fallback. Usually it comes from parents, schools, communities, etc., cetera, um, and shoulds from childhood that um, artistic isn't going to earn them a living or artistic isn't um, organized and planful and goal-oriented and you should be all of those things. Now, what happens is when, when you're counseling um, this combination, the first thing that has to happen is they have to own their artistic. And it's, artistic is a personality descriptor. It's not a career field. It's, it's, it's on the MBTI, it's the NF. And it's, it's kind of like we're saying, okay, we've got, an N, we've got an NF here. We're going to place them in a conventional ST career and hopefully they'll find some outlet for their, their artistic somewhere. But what happens is the conventional career drains them so much, drains their energy, literally their emotional energy so much that they don't have enough left over to really express themselves in their leisure and hobby interests. And it becomes very complicated. So um, I, m my take on it is that what we want to do, first of all, is work with the AC combination as early as we can get them in life and move them into the social and investigative corners of the hexagon um, where they can um, be their artistic self. Remember I said that adjoining corners of the hexagon have overlapping characteristics? If they're working in a social occupation, in, in counseling or teaching, they can bring their artistic personality to that. If they're working in an investigative, um, curious, um, uh, career field, they can bring their artistic creativity, their imagination to that. But if they're working in a conventional work environment, they can't. They, you, you can't bring artistic into a conventional work environment. There's too much tension between the two. So that's a very long answer, but it's probably one of the biggest questions that comes up uh, with people who come for career counseling because they want to satisfy both. Uh, that's that's probably ten minutes more than I needed to say. So let's another question if you've got it. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. Um, Janine, I think what's the clarification is more of a clarification question. Um, what did Judy say was revealed on the MBTI for undifferentiated uh, reset codes? Usually, what I see are um, uh, slight PCI, slight um, I I you might call them scores, but we don't. Um, it's lack of clarity on the middle two letters usually. Very often we'll get clear EI and clear JP and nothing going on in the middle. Great. Okay, here is another from Mark. Um, uh, Judy mentioned to be ready for career explore. Okay, I'm sorry. Let me start over. Judy mentioned to be ready for career exploration, there should be two things present. One is stability of interest, and two, he wasn't sure about. Personality differentiation. Oh, great. So defining um, one, two, or three codes that separate from the others. Um, and here is actually well, two questions. Um, I'll put them together from Faith. Um, would you do the OCC Daydreams exercise with 17-year-old high school seniors? And the other one is what exercises besides the strong do you suggest using with high school students? I do the occupational daydreams all the time with groups. I love it because they can share them with each other and high school, it works fine with high school students. And I don't know what you mean by other um, exercises. Um, there, uh, in the user's guide, there's several activities for, for use, group activities for use around the strong. Um, I, I outline several. Of, one is, um, is a little competition where they come up with television programs and what the coding is. They can code various types of cars, hobbies, and leisure interests. Anything where you get them discussing the reset codes. Great. Um, do you have time for a couple more? Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see here. From Dr. Hart is, let's hear, so therefore how important might it be to talk with the client and perhaps parents for high school students about interests and preferences, similarities and differences? Pretty important. I mean, that's, that's usually the introduction to the career counseling, career guidance process. Um, and when you're working with high school students, of course, the parents are involved. So that's, um, 
you know, there's there's absolutely nothing wrong with talking about the the hexagon before you actually administer the strong. And I think uh, the more that students and parents know about the hexagon, um, the more um, the more they know about the world of work. You don't do that with the MBTI, by the way. Don't confuse those. But with the with the um, strong, we're dealing with much more concrete information. Great. Let's, let's do one more, and then uh, we'll actually get into the profile itself. Okay. Um, here's one by, let's see, Mark. Uh, uh, let's see here. This is, what, if any, correlation do you know between the military's ASVAB assessment and the strong? There are, and they're published in the manual. Um, but remember, the ASVAB is measuring um, uh, skills and abilities. There's a little interest questionnaire that's a part of it as well, and they actually validated that against um, they validated that against the strong. I know they did. They validated against the SDS as well. But it, um, we can validate all kinds of skills uh, related to personality. Um, how just keep in mind that people have a right to be really good at something they don't like doing. And in the military, sometimes people are slotted into positions that don't necessarily draw on their personality, but they get they become very good at it. Okay, can I move into the profile a little bit, Karen, and then we're going to yeah. stop again in about uh, in just a few minutes. Sounds good. And what I have up here is the um, the cover page for the most common form of the strong, which is the profile, and it's um, it's accompanied by an optional interpretive report. This happens to be the standard profile plus some additional college pages and the interpretive report. Um, there's some other forms that there's a special there's some special profile pages for high school students and their parents. Uh, there's an interpretive report that combines the strong and the MBTI. There's a simplified report called I Start Strong that's based on just the general occupational themes and the basic interests. Um, I'm primarily focusing on the standard profile today because that comes with every report form except for I Start Strong. Then I'm just going to show you some pieces of the other reports as they relate to various slide topics. All of the strong reports, with the exception of I Start Strong, include a profile that has scores for these scales, um, six themes, 30 basic interests, and 130 occupations. Now there are also five scales that are not reset coded um, that describe respondents' style of working and learning. And there are also some administrative indexes for, um, for our use as career practitioners. In fact, we're going to look at those right now. Uh, these are the checkpoints on the strong profile. Excuse me, I need to clear my throat. Okay. Um, these are the checkpoints on the strong profile to see if the results are within a somewhat normal pattern. Um, what I usually say to respondents is there's some, there's some um, numbers that I check before even meeting with them to see if the results are going to make sense, if they're going to hang together. Um, if, now, if these numbers are not within a normal pattern, you're going to want to consider some alternative interpretation strategies. Um, for instance, uh, more than 15 omissions will significantly affect the scoring and interpretive boundaries of the, of the scales. Typicality index lower than 17 suggests that the respondent is not typical of the norm group with whom he or she is being compared. Make sure you check that out if you're working with international students, first generation U.S. residents, um, uh, any populations that are not adequately represented in the norm group. And then we look for roughly a 35, 25, 40 split um, distribution of like, indifferent, and dislike responses across all of the sections of the profile. And there are guidelines in the user's guide to give the exact boundaries of interpretability for each of these categories. Um, for instance, <clears throat> if the typicality index is way low, or the response percentages are super skewed in one direction, you're probably not going to want to use the profile results to explore college majors or to explore specific career fields. Um, you could discuss interpretation strategies with a certified practitioner or um, jump into the LinkedIn group. We have a LinkedIn group for strong practitioners. And uh, it's wonderful. People discuss all of these um, strange things that happen in strong profiles. 
Now the profile begins with descriptions of the six RIASEC themes, which are called the GOTS, followed by a graph of respondents' scored results. Notice that the scores are standard scores. They're not percentiles. And they compare respondents to men and women in general. The interpretive comments in the bars, the very high, the high, the moderate that you can see there, compare respondents to just their gender. We might interpret this student's highest GOTS um, something like this. Your scores of 70 and 69 on the artistic and social themes are considered very high for women in general and suggest a general liking for using creativity to help others. If you want to be a little more technical, you might say that her scores of 70 and 69 are at the 98th and 97th percentile. Remember, the standard scores on the profile but they're at the 98th and 97th percentile compared to men and women in general. They're in the top 3%. And there's a standard score to percentile conversion chart in the user's guide. Most people don't need it. The interpretive comments are enough. But if students are used to hearing percentiles a lot, sometimes it's nice to show them the chart. Now these themes are broad personality descriptors. And full descriptions can be found in the user's guide and the Where Next interpretive booklet. They're further described in the interpretive report, which you see here. And they're linked to college majors in the college profile pages. These themes answer the career exploration questions, who am I and why do I want to work? And they usually correspond to the middle two letters of MBTI type. There's a lot of overlap. We're going to be talking about that, by the way, in the uh, December webinar. Now the I Start Strong report, remember I mentioned it's a little different. The I Start Strong presents the themes in more of a narrative style without references to how much interest respondents have in each category. Scores and interpretive comments are inten and, um, intentionally omitted. Each theme, I'm going to show you how to do this, each theme, sorry, each theme links to the CPP Career Exploration Platform for more information. My computer's doing all sorts of strange things. I apologize. Now, on the profile, the themes are followed by 30 basic interest scales. Um, we call them BISs, which narrow down the general occupational themes into very specific interest areas. Remember, it's like moving from the state in which we live to the city or town. They represent all areas of life, work, school, leisure, relationships, just about anything. And they're scored and interpreted the same way as the gods. You know, I, uh, I just, it just, it just occurred to me, I, I was um, in a high school class yesterday. I don't do that very often. And um, the teacher asked me uh, if we weren't using this, this, uh, uh, an assessment, um, how could we kind of help high school students to figure out what their theme code was? Because we had been talking about the hexagon. And I, you know, just on the spur of the moment, I just asked them what television programs they like to watch. That's all. That was the only question I asked. And I made a list of them on the board. And, you know, it, it overlapped. The, the, the TV programs and what pe those kids shared, um, I was just thinking as I listened to them, my gosh, their coding is so clear. When they're not living by their shoulds, when you leave high school students their own devices, what do they go to naturally? And what they watch on television is, is one of the things they go to, go to naturally. And I'm sure people, someone more familiar with video games and YouTube and all of the other things surely could, could weave all of that information in as well. Now, Section 2 of the profile lists respondents' top five and bottom three business, just list them outright. The two groups of business will usually have different themes. For instance, note on this one that the top five businesses have artistic and social themes. The respondents' top two themes. This is the one who was um, AS on the on the GOTS, and her bottom three are all realistic, which was her lowest theme. These are the scales that are the most helpful in academic advising. Any one of the top businesses that corresponds um, that corresponds with the respondents' top two themes suggests possible career majors, um, uh, possible majors and careers. And you know, I said that kind of fast, and it's pretty important. If you're looking at the top five interest areas and you're exploring majors, 
go to the top five interest areas that are consistent with the student's overall theme code. So any of these might fit. Now the college profile pages even suggest specific campus activities and college courses that might be of interest related to each biz. I'm going to pause after the next slide. So again, get your questions ready. But, I wanted, but first I want to show you the I Start Strong report. Um, and, and the biz is the, the I Start Strong report links the business to the CPP Career Exploration Platform. and suggest specific areas of studies, career fields, occupations, and activities. And I'm going to compare this. Um, we're going to break after, uh, right now for a few minutes to take some questions. Then I'm going to come back and compare the occupations here on the I Start Strong report with the occupations on the uh, Full Strong profile. Um, Karen, I'll pause right there for a few minutes to see if any more questions have come in, especially around maybe the business, how they relate to the GOTS. Let's see. Um, no, I don't see one specifically for that, but I, I oh, actually, here we go. We just, we just got some in. Um, from Michelle, how do you handle it when uh, BITs are different, or BI, is it BITs are different than GOTs, or the top five BITs are all over the place in terms of theme codes. The BISs? BISs? Yeah. Okay, this is for Michelle? Yes. Mm -hmm. BISs, yeah. That's right. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, the, the GOTS, the themes, answer the question, who am I? And why is work important to me? What motivates me? So that's the personality. The business are, what do I like to do? Very specific interests. So for instance, if, if, if their business are all over the place, they're probably not differentiated. I, mean, that's, I was trying to kind of demonstrate that with my little um, hexagon with all the stars popping up from when I was four years old. Um, you're looking for a pattern. And what you, what you want to encourage is exploration of business that are related to the gods. Um, and one thing that I've noticed is the business are, um, are pretty transparent. You can look at the questions on the strong and, and kind of um, see what they're measuring. Um, and very often with young people especially, their business are going to just represent what their parents have told them to like, what they've been exposed to in school, which might be a broad pattern, and or you know, what they've been exposed to just in their uh, in their communities or their churches and synagogues, whatever. Um, it's it's just what they know about. Whereas the themes go deeper than that. The themes are the, their overall motivation in life. It's what they want to express about themselves. Okay, um, here is one that. Uh, this, is a, this is a great question. Um, this is from Chrissy. So since this is a gender-based assessment, has there been any research on this assessment with transgender or non-gender conforming students? Um, yes. In, in fact, um, you know, I, I've been corresponding this year and, and talking with Mark Pope, who's an expert in this area at uh, St. Louis University, and, and also Cheryl, who's, the, who's our, um, the coordinator of our strong certification program about this. Um, and it's being, uh, I can't tell you the results, it's, it's not my area of expertise, but I can tell you that um, research is ongoing, um, that there doesn't be, tend to be a lot of difference, and, and she, I know Cheryl's listening, she might jump in here, um, there doesn't appear to be a significant difference between um, people who, who are reporting a non-biological um, non gender and people who are the biological gender. It's, it's important that when they indicate their gender on the strong, they indicate the gender with which they primarily identify because that's the norm group that they're going to be compared to. And um, uh, Cheryl might be sending you a comment literally as I speak because she says it much better than I do. But we, we discussed this in the uh, certification program. It's an important point. Great. It's, and I, yeah, I want to interrupt just one one point. Yeah. Um, 
yes, the strong has gender comparisons, but remember you're also being compared with the male and female um, combined group. So it, it's, uh, it, you have both. You have the full population, and then, you, and then it breaks it down. And, and you know, all of us have struggled with this for 30 years. Um, but men and women respond to the strong differently. They respond to the workplace differently. They, they react differently to their jobs. Um, they have different life patterns. And CPP has taken the position that they're going to stick with the research as long as research is showing up these significant differences. Um, other instruments have chosen to ignore those differences. It's just as long as you know what an instrument does, you can build that into your interpretive strategy. Okay. So um, here's another from Kimberly. So what percentage is a good match for careers? For example, is a 60% rating too low? A 60%, I don't know. I'm sorry, I don't know what a 60% rating would be. I don't know. Um, hmm. I'm, I guess I'd, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, what's, her, what's the name of the person who asked the question? Uh, Kimberly? Kimberly, I'm not sure what you're asking about. On the basic interest scales, um, you know, the, the top five are, are where you want to start exploring, whichever ones are consistent with the GOTS. Um, and hopefully you're going to have one or two that are higher than moderate. Great. If we're talking about occupations, we're going to look at some different numbers. Those are coming up next. Great. Oh, and Cheryl just sent in um, a reply. She says, the important point is that a client is that a client indicates the gender with which they identify. That gives the client the best gender comparison data. When a client identifies as gender neutral or gender queer, then they need to pick a gender to start with, and the practitioner can also run the results against the other gender. So the full spectrum is offered. Hope that helps. Thank you. Right. Is, is, that, is that from Cheryl? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that, you know, um, I feel like that kind of rush, you rushed through that really quickly. Could you, could you say it a little bit more slowly? Yeah, that's, you criti the whole that's thing? critical. Yeah, and it, it's critical because this is true of the gender question, but it's true of any section of the strong. It's all you're looking for is a starting point for the exploration process. And I think that's what Cheryl is indicating. You don't have to read the whole thing. Uh, <laughs> I think what Cheryl is emphasizing that if someone is gender neutral or they don't know what to put, just have them pick a starting point. And you can always score for the opposite gender. Exactly. That was the point I was going to jump in and make, Judy, is that you now have the ability to score for the opposite gender at no additional cost. So uh, okay. you, have, oh, okay. you, have, you have both of those at your disposal as, as a resource as you're helping those transgender students. Yeah, perfect, Jack. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both, Jack and Cheryl, for, for um, sharing that. Um, and I think what you're going to see when you look at the results, um, for the two genders on the same person, you're going to see more overlap than not. I mean, don't think you're going to get two separate reports. You might get, the theme codes might be adjusted in a different order, but um, you'll see some, a lot of overlap. Good, important important question. Let me um, let me talk about the ASAs because uh, that's pretty important, and then we're going to pause again um, in just a little while. Is that okay, yeah. Karen? Yeah, thank you. Um, I hope you remember that we started with very broad reassect general occupational themes, and we compared them in a geographic analogy to the state in which we live. Then we narrowed down to 30 basic interest scales, like the city or town. Now we're going to look at street addresses. We're going to take it one step further and narrow down to 130 occupational scales. And the occupational scales change gears entirely. Instead of being compared to people in general, now you're being compared to workers, specific workers in 130 occupations who like their work and do their jobs in a typical way for the occupation. And what you're looking for through, throughout the high occupations are recurring codes. When you have um, theme codes that come up across occupations, it's reflecting similarity with workers in like-themed work environments. And that's what the occupations do. Now the profile first lists respondents' top 10 and bottom 5 occupational scales. The two groups of occupational scales will often represent opposite theme codes, just like the business did, and that's another indication of the differentiated personality. 
This respondent happens to have an ASE theme code, and notice how often A, S, and E show up in her top 10 occupations. Scores are derived on the occupational scales. Scores are derived from how often respondents answer the items on the strong in the same way as the occupational sample answered the items. So we're not just looking at likes here. We're looking at likes, indifference, dislikes. It's across the board. These are heterogeneous scales. Now the meat of the strong, what makes it a restricted psychological assessment, lies in the comparison of the basic interest scales, which are homogeneous and fairly transparent in their content, and the occupational scales, which are heterogeneous and impossible to skew. When someone scores high on a basic interest scale and related occupations, the predictive validity of the results increases significantly. For instance, compare this student's bizzes in the upper left, and OSSES. And note, note how often writing and mass communication shows up in her occupational scales. You've got public relations director, broadcast journalist, arts and entertainment manager, and also teaching and education. I see school counselor, university administrator, career counselor, instructional coordinator. That's what you're looking for is, is when business and, and um, uh, OSSES collide. Now we often use the occupational scale codes to verify respondents' initial theme codes. Remember the GOTs come from answering strongly like and like to questions on the strong. The OSSES come from answering questions on the strong the same way that people in the occupations did. So when they both come up with the same code, one reinforces the other. I sometimes refer to the GOTs as, uh, as wannabe codes. Um, and then the OSSES serve as the reality check. The profile includes scores for all of the 130 occupations sampled. And scores over 39 are significant and indicate more similarity to workers in the occupation than is likely to happen by chance. And, uh, um, you know, I wonder, um, Karen, I wondered when you asked the question about what percentile would be a cutoff for a good match, I wondered if um, the questioner was referring more to the occupational scales um, than to the business and the, and the gods. And by the way, these two are standard scores. They're not percentiles. Now, the occupations on this particular slide are all related to the respondent's highest theme, which is artistic. You see how much green there is beyond that vertical line? And that's, um, this person is, is similar to people who, cre who have created creative, independent, artistic work environments. And compare that with her lowest theme. These are realistic occupations. There's no similarity at all. Now, additional information on the occupations can be found in both the college and the interpretive reports. And the top 10 occupations linked directly to ONET from all of the reports. And I'm going to walk you through that process a little bit, and then I'm going to pause again to talk about the occupational scales and how they differ on, uh, on the two reports. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to, I hope this works, I'm going to uh, link to public relations. That was one of the occupations on, on the reports. And we go directly into ONET for public relations and fundraising managers. Once we get to ONET, this is the government uh, job site. Uh, we have tasks, tools and technology, knowledge required, skills, abilities, work activities. And a lot of this, by the way, is summarized in the strong interpretive report. Um, so if you're just using the profile and you don't have the interpretive information, um, you can go from the profile directly to ONET, or if you have the interpreter report, it makes it a little easier. You get work context, job zone, education. Most, I think most of you are familiar with this. The interest is important. Um, notice here, right here, that ONET codes public relations manager as EA, and the strong codes it as AE. And this is important. ONET codes occupations according to the tasks that are done, 
the strong codes occupations according to the personalities of the people who are doing the work. And remember what I said about five times at the beginning, that, that work environments are formed by the people in them, not by the tasks that are done. And the overlap between ONET coding and strong coding is a little better than 70%. Um, it doesn't hurt, though, to have dual codes and, uh, and look at both of them and discuss both of them. Work values here. Get a lot of related occupations. I love it that they're now indicating those um, occupations that have a green emphasis, and you can click on them and see what's green about them. Uh, the outlook. And then you have wages. You have, um, national wages that are very recent. You can also go to a state. Down here, I can go right to California. Job openings for state and both uh, state and national job banks and additional information. I love ONET. What I would have given to have had ONET when I was learning how to be a career counselor. We used to have something called the Dictionary of Occupational Titles. I, I think I can hear some groans from the career counselors who were older than 45. And we had to look these occupations up in the DOT. Oh my goodness. Now one other thing before I pause again for questions about the OSSES. This is uh, from the I Start Strong report, which also links to ONET. But it does it a little differently. The I Start report only includes the GOTS and BISs. So the ONET link is through the business. So the occupations that you're going to get, these related occupations over here, are related to the writing and mass communication biz. biz. They're not necessarily representing a similarity to workers because we don't have those occupations on, we don't have that um, occupational scale construction uh, on the ISTART report. Now, the I-START occupational links take us to the same place on ONET, but the occupational titles might not be the same as the occupations you, had, uh, you have on the full standard profile because they're based differently. Um, it works like this. Um, for uh, the I-START Strong Report, you can click, click on the biz, which will take you to the career exploration platform, and then you can click on the job title, and we end up right at ONET where we were before. Or if you're right on the ONET report and uh, the, the, uh, the student is working from a PDF on their, on their monitor, you can actually link directly on the occupation. And without going through the biz, that takes you directly to ONET. So they can either explore it by learning about the biz first, or they can go directly to the occupational title. I think um, probably that's, there might be some questions about the OSIS, Karen, before we jump into the PISs. I'm just sorting through right now. I know. <laughs> <laughs> You're great. <laughs> okay. Um, here is, well, let's see here. Here's one from Space that asks about, um, let's see, do you, do you find that with youth who do have two to three GOTs that are very high and high, the occupational skills are confirming of a path they might want to explore even though they may be going through a phase, a phase as an adolescent where they are enamored of a field, hobby, potential occupation and have not really explored much? Yeah, I, uh, I think at the beginning of the question you said there's some, there's some high themes. Yeah, uh, it's says very high and high. Yeah, and the and the the are are um, you know kind of a reality check against those high themes. Um, remember, I, I use the osses just as a starting point for exploration, and they can't fake them. It, it's if you come up high on an os, it's because you share the likes, the dislikes, and the indifference of of workers in the occupation. Um, so I, I think it's a good starting point. I mean, anything that will get the youth to um, just click on an occupation and learn about it. And because and, you, what you're doing is you're opening the door for discussion. You're not saying, go do this job. OK, thanks. Um, here's another from Kathleen. If someone has an answer set that is skewed towards dislike and their OSs are low, do you still use 40 as a cutoff? Can you drop to, say, a 35? 
Well, it depends on whether or not this, the profile is actually within the interpretable range. If it's skewed too far towards dislike, um, we don't really interpret it. Uh, yeah, if it, now if it's within the interpretable range and you don't have um, and, you did, and you don't have a, a lot of high occupations, yes, but drop it one point at a time and never drop below 36. Is it's you're, you're getting a half of a stand once you get to a half of a standard deviation, there's a real significant difference there. But again, I, I check check the user's guide to make sure that the profile is, is interpretable begin with, to begin with. If it isn't, then um, I'd go with the next strategy we're going to talk about instead, which is backdooring through the PISs. Let's see. Uh, here's a um, comment from Dr. Hart. Work environments formed by the people in them. Work tasks are formed by the people in charge of the environment, maybe. Interesting similarities and differences between ONET and STRONG. I like that. Yeah. yeah, it could be. It could be, but I think, um, yeah, uh, I'll just, an example from my childhood, I think I, I mentioned my childhood, this was college actually, um, I think I um, mentioned that I, at some point I dropped out of college and I got a certificate in business office management and bookkeeping. And the job that I got, got was as a bookkeeper in the um, business office of the Syracuse Symphony Orchestra. And let me tell you, they were not conventional bookkeepers. <laughs> they were, um, well, I, I was the rehearsal pianist for the, for the orchestra. So I was kind of going in the artistic direction at that time. Um, and I remember my other two colleagues, and, and we were doing uh, data recording and uh, fundraising records and all of that. None of us were conventional. Um, it, 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 I was the most conventional. There was nothing about that environment that was a conventional environment. It was strictly an artistic environment where we were doing a bookkeeping task. And the, the director, the supervisor of the office was artistic. So that's, I mean, that's an example. I know that's an extreme example. And I didn't stay in that job very long. But um, it, it, really, it really brought to the front of my brain that it's the people you're working with that form the environment. You know, I, I want to say one other thing about counselors, too, because I, we hear, we do certification online for both the STRONG and the MBTI, and so we get to know our participants really well. And what I notice is when, um, when we get uh, people, when people come into our program who, are, who have atypical personality types for counselors, and for instance, they might be enterprising, conventional, social and they're working on a college campus where the, um, the counselors are mostly social artistic. And so the, the um, enterprising conventional social will say, there's something wrong, I don't fit in, I'm not accepted. What they're saying, and they're usually the career counselor, by the way, it's the enterprising conventional social that's going to be drawn to career, where the artistic social, the social artistic is more towards general counseling and therapy. And so the career counselor is saying, I, this is the wrong career for me. And what we talk about is finding an environment uh, where career counseling is done in an enterprising conventional social way. End of lecture. <laughs> let's do. Uh, let's do. What, that's just so important. Uh, let's uh, let's take one more question. Then we're going to talk about the PISs, the personal style scales. Okay. So I have a few questions that I promised a few of them. I'm gonna, a few of attendees. I'm going to ask. I'll, I'll save those for the end um, okay. because we got another one um, from Andrea. That she's asking. Can you talk a little about the negative numbers on the OSs? Ah, the, the, all that, that's simple. The negative scores on the OSIS just indicate that every time the worker said like, you said dislike. You responded in the opposite direction. Uh, you know, we joke in the, in the live certification programs, we talk about that, that um, probably not a good career choice because you're the opposite. <laughs> um, I'm not even sure that they're, they're going to be in your friendship circle or, or even a significant other because you're just so different. That's all. <laughs> Thanks. Should we hit the pizzas and then come back around? Yeah, let's come back around because I do have a few more, several more questions. So thanks, Judy. Okay.
Personal style, style scales are interesting. There are five of them. And they're not REASEC theme coded, but they can provide very helpful information for exploring college majors and career fields and for differentiating GOTS on, um, on flat profiles. Work, there's work style, which reflects a preference for working with people versus working with data, ideas, and things. Um, learning environment, the kind of environment that will be the most motivating. Leadership style, it's about a, a preference for leading and directing others versus leading by example. Risk taking, liking to take chances versus playing it safe. And team orientation, a preference for collaborating with others versus working independently. Now these scales are bipolar. Scores in each direction have significantly different interpretive meanings. We don't talk as much about high and low as we do right and left. And scores to the right of 54 usually identify with the definitions on the right. Scores to the left of 46, the definitions on the left. And that 46 to 54, that's the mid-range. And that will usually, people who score in the mid-range usually identify with some of each, of each poll. And I, you know, my preference for interpreting the personal style scales is never to tell them what the personal styles, styles mean. I ask them. What, what their scores on the personal style scale suggest and how they live them out in their lives. Now these scales describe how respondents prefer to work and learn within their general occupational themes. Here's a for instance. A person with a primarily social artistic theme code who scores to the right on work style and leadership might enjoy working with others, would probably enjoy working with others, maybe even managing others in an environment that provides educational or counseling services. That scores to the right on work style and leadership, for instance, the person we're looking at here. On the other hand, a person with the same theme code, let's say social artistic, who scores to the left on work style and leadership might enjoy working in the same environment, but more behind the scenes or one-on-one -on -one with those she's helping. Now the personal style scales are a great way to tease information out of a profile that's either flat or undifferentiated. In the certification program, we have a mantra that goes, you can be godless and bizless and even osless, but no one is ever pizzless. The pizzas are almost always a comfortable point from which to engage respondents in conversation to begin the exploration process. And that's what you're trying to do around the strong. You're trying to engage the student or client um, in a discussion that leads to career exploration. With undifferentiated profiles, um, Cheryl, our strong certification program, instructor who helped us a few minutes ago, likes to use the pizzas to open up discussion and initially engage students. This process reinforces that the strong does not provide answers. Its purpose is to guide the exploration process in any way that's helpful. Now, the strong manual lists um, college majors and career fields related to each PIS. And we can even use the PISs to access that when we're talking about college majors and careers. And I've pulled out just a couple of examples to show you. For instance, here's some college majors related to each pole of the work style scale. and some careers. Remember, these are just starting points for discussion. As you mentioned these majors and career fields, you want to be listening for reset clues from the respondent. Can you see the social enterprising flavor in the works with people scores here? And the IRC flavor in the works with ideas, data, things scores. And when you get those clues, you can start talking about the gods. Here are some college majors related to each pole of the risk-taking scale. When I'm backdooring using the PISs, I don't interpret the GOTS and BISs and OSs first. I, um, I'll talk about the hexagon and talk about it very generally. I'll move to the next slide while, while I'm talking here. These are careers related to risk-taking. I think they're pretty obvious. Um, so I, if you can just describe the hexagon of work environments and personalities, and then start talking about the PISs, um, then reference back to the GOTS as, as you engage 
them in conversation. So you're listening for clues is what you're doing. Any opportunity to bring the hexagon up again. Do you see some reset um, clues in, in these um, different career fields? And again, these are just some examples. You can get the full listing, of course, in the manual. Now, the most common use of the PIS is, is to describe individual style within the themes. The person with a realistic theme, for instance, who wants to work with people. But when profiles are flat or undifferentiated, we're just trying to engage the respondent and tease out any information that will give us a starting place for a theme code. So looking for clues. If you're interpreting a score higher than 54 on work style or team orientation or leadership and the student is engaged and interested, think about how you might introduce the social and enterprising guys. And scores higher than 54 suggest enterprising and realistic. And you can begin to discuss those themes. Learning environments higher than 54 suggest investigative or artistic. Well, that's all I'm going to say about the instrument itself. Um, there are resources to help you with this drawing. These are my favorites. Actually, I wrote a lot of them, so I guess they're my favorites. <laughs> and there, there aren't hundreds and hundreds of resources on the Strong like there are on the MBTI. And it's because the Strong is just used f for career counseling um, and academic advising. It, it doesn't have the broad application that the Strong does, I mean, excuse me, that the MBTI does. So you're not going to see publications popping up every day. Now, there are a couple of ways to become certified to purchase and interpret the Strong. Um, you can complete the certific a certification program either online or um, in a live um, public certification program. We do one in Lake Tahoe every June. And I've put up a, a promotion code there, CPP14. Um, if you use that for our June program, we'll give you um, a nice promotional discount. We have a couple of other webinars coming up. November 7th, um, Sandra Stroop is going to be talking about evaluating career development programs. Really important in these days of getting funding on college campuses um, specifically. Um, as our programs move forward and grow. And then I'm coming back again in December to talk um, about using the Strong and the MBTI together. CPP is always wonderful about offering um, a promotional discount. Um, they're offering 10% off of your purchase of, um, of their products. Uh, you need, there's a, uh, there it is, the promotion code is expert913 to get that 10% uh, discount. You can use it um, until Friday, October 18th, and not after that. And you, and you can't use it on your webinar certificate. <laughs> you can use it on other CPP products. Uh, it's also not available if you're licensing Skills 1 for the first time or renewing your Skills 1 scoring sites. It's not for that. This is for products. Use it for um, Use it for assessments or use it for the support materials that we talked about on the previous slide. This doesn't apply on international orders. For international customers, um, you want to go to the cpp.com slash global sales website. And they'll talk to you about purchasing products. We have lots of conversations online around career exploration. And specifically on LinkedIn, there's one just for strong interest inventory practitioners. And that's where users of the strong um, present their questions and everybody gives feedback. It's, um, it's really amazing. I've, I've learned a lot. And uh, Cheryl, who's our strong program instructor, participates in that and gives her feedback. And I stick my nose in a lot, too. Karen, I'm going to turn it over to you for a couple of slides to, to talk about the certificate first and then email preferences. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and so as you may have all noticed, um, we are no longer able to offer the certificates um, free of charge. We are now having to, to add on a $7.95 um, processing fee for these. Um, the reason for this is we, had a, we were getting a lot of requests and we were not able to fill them in-house without additional costs. So, so that's the reason for that, because we want to keep these webinars free. Um, we want to continue to offer you all these great resources and materials that Judy has to offer and all of our other speakers. 
Um, so basically, we, what we did is we wanted to make this um, quicker because, as you may know, uh, many of you that request certificates, it would take upwards to about a month to receive that. So we wanted to um, improve the process and make it a lot faster. Um, you don't need to fill out a form this time, so you don't need to fill out any surveys or anything to request one. What we will be doing is our system will be automatically um, uh, uh, basically putting people into buckets. So those who are eligible are those who attended the webinar live webinar for one hour or longer. Um, so they are eligible to purchase a certificate. Um, our system will automatically track the views. So views means that you were sitting in on this webinar and watching this on your screen because that's how we can track it. Unfortunately, we cannot track phone calls. So if you just called in and you're not viewing it, unfortunately, that's not something that our system can track. Um, but, it, but it's still the same, so that, that hasn't changed. That's always been a requirement. Um, and so basically, those of you who are eligible will receive a certificate from us with more information on how you can purchase the certificate. Now, those who are not eligible are those who view the webinar for less than one hour, um, because like I said, we, we, we are able to track the time in attendance. Um, and if you have any questions, you know, you can always let us know. Um, Christine Nieto, she's actually in, in the room with me now. She's kind of behind the scenes, but she's doing a lot of the, uh, a lot of, answering a lot of the questions. So she's actually the one that's in charge of all the certificate questions, requests, anything like that. So you can always email her, um, and I will include her information in uh, both emails that you get from us. And Karen, um, j just to just to clarify, um, I think it's pretty obvious, but you you wouldn't get CEUs for um, viewing a webinar that's in the archive. Right, and thanks for bringing that up. Yes, um, uh, so you would not be eligible for that because. We are audited by NBCC, so we need to have proof that our attendees were in the live webinar. Um, and we do not, we are not able to track um, views after the webinar. So once it's posted on our website, we can't, we can't track those views. So, okay, yes, thank, thank you for asking thank that. You, sure. Um, and you, you probably want to talk about email preferences as well. Yes, and this one, um, this is important because we get many people who, um, who say that they don't get emails from us. And it may be that um, your email preferences are set to opt out. So at many times we get people asking, you know, I didn't get my invitation or I didn't get this or that. Um, so th this, this, may be, um, this may be why. So if you just go to cp.com slash email press, um, you can just go in and check your preferences to make sure that you are receiving emails from us. Um, and another thing is that I, I made a little note. So while you may still receive the webinar confirmation emails, those are not generated through our CBP system. So instead, those come through GoToWebinar, for which we don't manage those opt-outs. So, um, and this is something I wanted to kind of bring up, too. Um, we get many questions from attendees who uh, want to cancel their, their confirmation or their uh, attendance. They can't, they can't attend. And it's fine. I mean, if you can't attend, it's fine. I, I, really, I totally appreciate it when you email me that. That's great. Um, but if you don't want to continue to, to get these emails, because you will continue to get them, there is, if you go down to the bottom of the email, there is an option to be able to cancel registration. It's very small, and actually, I had no idea it was there until about a few months ago. So you are not the only ones. <laughs> but that's just if you don't want to continue to receive um, emails from GoToWebinar if you've decided that you can't attend. So just FYI, if that bothers you. So, yes, that's it. Thanks, okay. Judy. Okay. And just, uh, I'm going to leave this screen up because we've got about 10 minutes to take some questions, some, uh, to uh, wind up some questions. Uh, just introducing those of you who are new to CPP to Jim Larkin and Jack Powers, who are the uh, education account representatives. Jack has already been helpful in this webinar. I think Jim is on vacation this week, but either one of them can help you with your um, with your questions about the strong and, of course, other assessments that are used in uh, educational settings. Um, and we've also we've left the um, the codes of the discount and the um, the offer source code up here for you, um, just to have this up while we try to answer some more questions. So, Karen, what have you got? Great. So I promised Sarah that I was going to ask her question. She asked asked it a little while back. Let me just scroll up real quick. Okay. So this is going back to the to the first part of the webinar. Um, she asked, would you please explain again the response summary with the item response percentages? I'm not sure of the implications of these percentages. OK. And what I'm going to try and do for Sarah um, is find that slide number and see if I can pull that up. And I'm not sure I can, Karen. That's, that's OK. 
If you can't, uh, Sarah, um, you can always just email us as well. So. Yeah. Uh, in the, here it is. It, it's going to be something like 19. Ho oh, ho! Magic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. She's talking about um, response percentages down here. Um, and what happens is if uh, this is it's this is saying that throughout all the sections of the profile, this person answered 35% of the question. Uh, excuse me. The, um, a typical response rate would be 35% of uh, the responses in the like direction. And a typical response rate would be 25% in the indifferent and 40% in the dislike direction. If you fall too far out of these bounds, um, the profile becomes um, super skewed. If, if you have 80% in the like direction, everything's going to be high. If you have 80% in the dislike direction, there isn't going to be any information on the profile. So you want to keep within these bounds. And what I mentioned um, is that in the user's guide, there's a table that gives you actually for each one of these what the exact boundaries are for acceptable percentages. This is just kind of eyeballing it. Sarah, I hope that helps, and um, you can email one of the account reps or or me, and and uh, or uh, give us a call, and we'll talk you through it if you have a profile in front of you. Great, thank you. Um, here's one from Mark, and this is fun. So, so he says, um, can you complete the analogy? So, GOTS is who I am, BIS is what I like to do. What about OSs and TSs? OSs are where I want to do it. The, uh, the composite OS code describes um, the work environment. So you've got the who and the, the who, why, that's the gots, the what, the bizzes, the where is the composite OS code, and then the pizzes are how. How do I want to work? How do I want to learn? Cool. That's it. By the way, that um, that's described in... Um, Career Exploration for College Students Using the Strong and MBTI, where we use both instruments. We put them together to answer those questions. Great. Okay, from Jennifer, uh, how do you assist a student who got to rank very little and BIS's rank very little or low? It's, it could be, the first thing you want to do is that, that, uh, that the slide we just checked for Sarah, you want to check and make sure that the strong is within the interpretable range. But, um, and the, you're looking for response percentages, because if they're outside of the interpretable range, then the profile, the norms don't work. I mean, you're not going to use the strong. What you want to do is back up and find out why their responses are low. There are all kinds of um, reasons why somebody could have very have an extraordinary number of dislikes. It, they might not have understood the questions. Um, they might not have had any exposure. They might have been, you know, I, I worked with a, um, a college freshman last week who's been homeschooled. And just, uh, and homeschooling can be very, very um, broad and exposure to everything in the world. This particular young man had had no exposure whatsoever. And so every, everything was very low. Um, there could be clinical issues, it could be depression, it could be anything. But what you want to do is find out why they're low and, and, and take your discussion from there. I, I certainly will describe the GOTS to them. I love to describe that hexagon just to see if I can get them talking. And um, one of the uh, approaches that we use in the certification program is describing each corner of the GOT. So, I mean, of the hexagon, and I might start with realistic and describe realistic and then say to the student, what experiences have you had um, from what I've just described? And I'll actually make a note on my hexagon of television programs they've watched, or maybe they went camping, or um, they, they, they mow the lawn, or I mean, anything they talk about that's in the R corner, I'll write down. And I'll proceed around the hexagon to do that just to get the conversation going. Good question. Very important stuff, Jennifer. Great. Okay. So from Monica. So Monica's already been MBTI certified. So she's asking, for someone who is new to career counseling, would you suggest step two or strong certification? Well, of course, I'm a little biased. Um, you know, the strong is the standard for career assessments. And if, you're, if you call yourself a career counselor, you're probably using the strong. Um, the, the step two, uh, step two is wonderful, 
um, uh, I would have to say you, you want to get you want to get trained and certified on the strong and MBTI first, and then bring in the instruments that will give you nuances within that combination. That's the step two, and we tend to use it more for. Um, I use it more with adults. Yes, I use it with college students, and I know, Jack, you're going to jump on me. Um, I use it with college students, but only when the type is really unclear or something. I tend to use it more with, a, well, I always use it with adults. Yeah, no, Judy, I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, it's, it, uh, if given the option of a strong versus a step two uh, certification for a career counselor, the strong is the, is, is, is the clear answer. Yeah, and the strong, you know, I usually have people, new career counselors start with a strong because it provides a career counseling framework. The instrument itself gives you the framework that the MBTI then feeds into and the step two and work values inventory and whatever else you're using. Okay, uh, we got another, actually two, let's see, one is from Stephen, the other one's from Matthew. Um, basically asking how can MBTI how can the MBTI be used to, to integrate it with the strong? Um, Stephen's question was, how important is working with or combining the MBTI with the strong? We're doing, that's what the webinar is on in December. Um, and we also have an online um, program for master practitioners that, uh, that does it. Um, I, well, I, I'm going to give you just, just a quick answer. The MBTI takes a look at genetic predisposition. What are we meant to, who are we meant to be? The strong takes a look at what we've become. And when you put, because it's empirical, so when you put those two on the table, you've got the whole career process is in black and white. I can't use one without the other. How's that for a definitive TJ response, Karen? <laughs> I like it. <laughs> okay, let's see here. Um, there is, sorry, I'm sorting through. Okay, another from Faith. What would you say about someone whose PISs are right down the middle, no clear preference? The um, bizzes or pizzes? Uh, pizzes. P-I. Pro P-I. Yeah, probably the rest of their profile is going to be right down the middle as well. And probably their, um, the middle two letters of their type are going to be right in the middle. I mean, it's uh, the data tell the story. It's they're not they're not indicating a preference for anything. It's rare that the pizzas are right down the middle and everything else is shaped. <clears throat> if they are right down the middle, then they want some of each. And and you ask them, and you say to them, it, it looks like um, you sometimes prefer to work with people and you sometimes prefer to wor work with data. And go right down. Talk to me about how that plays out for you. And have them talk to you about what it means. Okay. From Cynthia, what if you get a student who seems to like everything or a student who seems to like nothing? Is that when you use the PISs and go around the hexagon? I would, yeah. That's the undifferentiated profile. When they like nothing, it, it's, that could be flat and depressed. So that's a little bit different. The likes everything is elevated. But yeah, you could start with the PISs. Um, you could use different cutoffs for scores. Okay. Um, here's another from um, Paola. I once had an international student from China who took the strong assessment. When reviewing the strong summary, I noticed all fields were indifferent. When I asked her some questions about it, she made a comment, in my culture, we don't, we don't so hate uh, or, or dislike something. We're always willing to try. Any limitations to strong MBTI and international students? Yeah, and that's um, that sounds. It sounds like um, is it Paola? Is, is yes. that the name of the person? It sounds Paola like you asked. You asked. A, um, you did. You did exactly what I would recommend, which is you. You explored what was going on, and you did it without um, saying, "Oh my gosh, there's something wrong here." You you left it open for discussion. Um, generally, um, the gods and bizzes and pizzas will carry across all cultures. Um, the asses don't. When, when you get outside of North America, um, the occupations have different definitions, different meanings, and so we don't focus so much on that part of the profile. But <coughs> in her case, 
um, it might be one of those rare instances where you have her retake the strong and take the indifferent out. And, and just tell her to, to respond in one direction or the other. It becomes a forced, kind of a forced choice. Um, it, it's, it's rare that you do that, and you never do it on the first administration. But as a retest, it's rec in the manual it says for certain situations it's a, it's a reasonable strategy. Karen, I know you have to keep an, an eye on the clock because someone's going to um, uh, be coming in on our webinar space in just a couple of minutes. Do we, do we have time for one more or not? We do, and I'm trying to figure out because there's so many good questions. Um, it's, uh, this one is, how does depression show up on the, on the pizzas and got? How does depression show up? Uh huh. Um, well, on the uh, what it shows up in those administrative indexes that we looked at, um, when when all of the scores are in the dislike direction, um, the PISs will be to the left, uh, and depression is something to explore. But we have to be very careful, though, that a depressed profile does not mean the person's depressed. It just means that there's a reason that they're responding in the dislike direction. And the gots, I mean, you have to, no likes, no gots, no bizzes. So you have to have likes to have gots and bizzes. And pizzas tend to skew towards the left, and osses will be very restricted. But then you have to find out the reason behind. It could be language. It could be anything. It could be culture. Great. Is that maybe um, a place that we should wind down? Yeah, yeah, and I was just going to make a comment. Um, I saw a question um, asking if the, uh, the the discount code can be used for certification, and that's not um, that can't be used on that. Um, it's only for strong and MBTI products. So, like Judy mentioned, um, for the assessments and for the booklets, things like that. Um, we, and, but we have our own discounts, though. Um, yeah, we're going to have you. <laughs> yeah, if they want to contact us, because we we can't dis discount the strong online certification by itself, but we do discount if you do the strong and the MBTI together. So there's a significant discount on the second certification, um, and we also discount the public programs um, for with, with that CPP. Um, I've forgotten what the promotion code was. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I think expert it was... 913? Or for yours? No, that, that's uh, Are you yours. referring I... to, the, to the early bird discount for public mm -hmm. certifications, Judy? No, we, we'll discount beyond that. Uh, I think it was um, CPP 14. Uh, yeah, I think it was just CPP 14 for us. But, you know, it, it, uh, when you register for a, a program, you're in touch with us. Um, either by phone or by email. So we'll talk about discounts when you get in touch with us. Great. All right. Well, thank you. So we we have run out of time, but thank you everybody for attending. Um, I know you're all very busy, so we really appreciate the fact that you sat in on this webinar. And also, thank you to all you tweeters. This time I wasn't blocked, so I was, I was very happy about that. So I appreciate it. I'm going to be announcing um, the winners later today. So I've been keeping track of everybody and trying to retweet at the same time. And thanks. You all have some really great content that you're sharing. Right. Great <laughs> participation today, Kara. Yes. Really good. Yeah. <laughs> and um, one quick thing. Um, if you do have questions, um, because I know we weren't able to answer them all, you can always contact Jack or Jen, um, which is why we leave up their contact info there. Um, and if it's like a product-related question, anything like that, um, just let us know. Just get in touch with us. Please send it yeah. my way. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, so guys. thank you, Judy, for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us today. It's always a pleasure. And so everybody, um, just so you know, as Judy had mentioned, um, we have our next webinar on November 5th, which is going to be on measuring the success of your career development program. Now to register, visit our website, which is cbp.com slash askanexpert. Remember to also check that same site to find all of our previously recorded webinars, as well as this one, in about a week or so. So thank you all for attending, and I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Karen. Bye-bye.